Now, please join me in welcoming Judith McKenna, President and CEO of Walmart International. Judith will be interviewed by Phil Waba, Senior Writer at Fortune. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, good morning to you, Judith. Good morning, Phil. Good what morning, a, everybody. What a pleasure to interview you. The, you know, you're coming off a strong year. I th you, you are at 100 billion, which uh, is kind of incredible. You know, it's a unit of Walmart, Inc., and on its own would be one of the biggest retailers in the world. So. Yeah. And there's also a lot of lessons uh, from what you see around the world uh, in the businesses you oversee. Uh, that can be instructive for everybody here today. Um, so let's start with the macro view. How is inflation playing out in the different marks and, uh, markets? And tell us what is different and what is similar in consumer behavior these days. Yeah, um, it certainly is. Inflation is it's clearly everywhere. It's a global phenomenon this time, and I'm sure people have, have talked about it a lot. We see it, of course, primarily in food. Inflation has been the most significant, and I was in Chile recently, and it's one of the highest inflations around the world. So every market that we operate in is dealing with inflation and the customers' reactions around that, and it's persistent. So this has been going on for some time. I think what do I see that's common around the world um, is not just the economic situation. So value is becoming really important to everybody, always has been, but we probably see that dialed up and that's that kind of economic backdrop. But I also see um, everybody seeing the volatility and the uncertainty in the world. And that is pushing people to think about who they trust and where they place their trust as well. The other one would be climate and weather and climate again global phenomena, you read about it everywhere, again, where we operate as well. So people are being way more thoughtful about what they buy and how they buy. Um, digitization, again, that is happening everywhere around the world, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more yeah. about that as well. And then finally, and it's interesting when, you know, some of it is volatility, uncertainty, and value, time and convenience for people is at an all-time high, as are people's expectations around that. So it's almost contradictory, but retailers everywhere are having to figure out how to, how to navigate that. And if I look at our markets around the world, you know, I look at China and I look at um, Omnichannel in China, we run um, stores and clubs there. Like that market is almost 50-50, so our business is, in terms of Omnichannel pickup from our stores. I look at India and our payments businesses and the digitization of payments there. And I look at Mexico, which is an incredible business. And I look at this building out of the ecosystem, which touches almost all five of those points that I talked about. Well, we'll get into uh, the tech uh, piece in a moment. But differences, what are you seeing uh, in terms of different co consumer behavior that is persisting in your markets? Yeah, and it's actually, I, I always start this with people are more similar than they are different. And um, whilst you can look at what the differences are, and I think you're seeing um, digital adoption on different curves, that China example would be one. You see in India, people leapfrogging where they are. You see in Mexico, this kind of converging into who do I trust, and I can get all of my services together. So I actually, um, whilst every market is a different stage of development, how governments play and intervene within a market and how yeah. they create stimulus, what policies from an economic perspective they're using can change things. But actually, people are more the same around the world. And as a retailer for us, centering on that and not forgetting that and remembering that is at the heart of what we do. Sounds like you have a very simple job. Um, so <laughs> before we dive into uh, some of the, a bit further into the, the tech examples you're giving, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's probably be worth it to, to remind the audience the markets that you are in because Walmart International is, uh, uh, everyone knows it's huge, but can you remind us, uh, or if you want to quiz me, I can tell <laughs> We were you. doing this thing, yeah. can you remember all the markets that we operate in? Yeah. I won't quiz you, I'll see if I can get them. Like, we actually operate in 19 countries around the world, but we have seven primary businesses in six markets. So we have China, 
Canada and Chile, Mexico, India, and South Africa. And um, that covers, um, outside of the US, excluding the US, Phil, that covers about 40% of the world's population. Right. through those markets that we that we operate in. And that's not just um, because we're in China and India. If I add up all of those other markets that we're in as well, they, they're probably greater in population size than the US. So this scale that we have, but very concentrated and very focused in businesses is, is really the key to who we are. So let's go back to China. You, you said a couple of minutes ago that digital is almost 50% of revenue, which is astounding. I mean, in the US, that kind of digital penetration is seen at luxury brands and not uh, mass merchandise, uh, mass uh, retailers. So um, first of all, can you tell us how uh, that behavior has changed, if at all, since the reopening? Um, I won't say post-COVID because I don't want to jinx it. It's around, but, you know, the, the reopening of the country. Uh, but also, you know, um, what do you think uh, in terms of Chinese consumer behavior uh, at your store do you think uh, we could see here yeah. eventually? Yeah, I think, listen, China's been an incredible case study for us. We've operated in China for many years. We have two formats there. We have Sam's Clubs, which many people here in the US will be familiar with, and we have Walmart stores as well, so the two formats. Um, we always saw a higher digital penetration for our businesses um, than we did anywhere else in the world, but that certainly accelerated, and this pace of change that happened as the country went through COVID and these huge bouts of lockdown that happened as well. Um, that has just reached, it's almost at the 50% mark for our business, and I should say that that is all store pick out of our stores and clubs. That isn't a marketplace business. We don't have that in China. Um, I'm sure a lot of people who operate there saw the same thing. You know, the restrictions lifted really fast. Um, yeah. I know in our business, like, everybody got COVID. Yeah. And that was an interesting one. How do you f work through that? And how do, you, um, how do you still operate through that? That has all settled down hugely now. And the business is thinking about you know, what's that right balance? How do we facilitate that amount of volume being picked in a store? And the stores and clubs are still really busy as well. So we, like we did around the world, we saw some settling between stores and e-com, but I wouldn't say there was any great swing post reopening one way or another. But we've learned so much from the teams there about how to pick at volume as well. Um, let's move all the way to Mexico. Uh, you operate three formats in Mexico, we I believe, do. Including, including bodegas, which, of course, bodegas are uh, familiar to New Yorkers as our short, for, short word for convenience store. I'm yeah. sure they're not the same. Um, but uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the successful ways uh, you've drummed up business. And we were discussing uh, f phone, uh, the, the role of mobile phones yeah. in, in, in you capturing uh, yeah. more, more market share. Yeah, so uh, um, Walmax business, which runs uh, Mexico and Central America, is a publicly listed, um, public listed company, um, which we're the majority owner in that. And it's an amazing business. I was there about a month and a half ago, and I love going. They're building out, this word ecosystem is overused in some ways. But what I see them building, Phil, truly is an ecosystem. And the beautiful thing about what they're doing is they're putting the customers right at the heart of it, which we all say that we do. But they figured out what solutions are they trying to find for the Mexican um, consumer. So we have stores, um, those three formats that you talked about, just over 3,700 of those. We have um, omni-channel, so we have um, grocery online, pickup and demand. We have a marketplace. And they've looked really carefully at what services can be provided to help solve the pain points for their customers. So they have Cashy, which is um, a payments app, safe and secure, and they can help people get credit. They've just recently launched a health membership for about $1.60 a month. But one of the ones that I really like is in trying to solve what they thought the problem was, which was um, how do we get people to shop online? They realized as they did the customer research, they were solving the wrong problem. Because the question was actually, how do you get people online? 
like even before you take the step into shopping, and access to data was really hard and really expensive. So the business is now um, now has an MVNO business, so telecoms and um, internet, providing data, low-cost data to customers right across uh, Mexico. It's one of the largest in Mexico today. And so what started off as how do I get you to yeah. shop there actually is how do I solve a problem for the country and for the people who come into our stores, which then will lead to how do I connect you to everything else. So I love the way they thought about that. And it was a real lesson to us around the world, which is don't make assumptions. Yeah. Like, when you want to know, really talk to customers in depth, in detail, and figure out what it is that's stopping them. And that's particularly true for an international business because it would be really easy for us to go, oh, we tried that there and that didn't work. And in fact, in Mexico, in the bodegas, we have a kiosk in store where you go and order on the kiosk. We tried that years ago in the UK and it didn't work. But in Mexico, the consumer doesn't yet have the amount of trust that they need, they still maybe don't want to use their data. And that's an easy and convenient way for them to connect and they can pay with cash in store. Right. So that open-mindedness is, I think, a hallmark of how you run international businesses. Um, let's talk about India for a moment. Uh, India's a tough nut to crack for uh, retailers. Uh, you seem to have found uh, your way. Um, obviously, there's your involvement with Flipkart and, and Fonte. So walk us through uh, Cliff Notes version of, of India and, and how you're making your way there. Yeah, so um, you always have to start with the macro for India and the size of the opportunity. So 1.4 billion people, a, um average age of 28 and a growing economy, one of the faster growing economies in the world and you can see it having a place um, increasingly on the world stage as well. The um, the Indian government did some really interesting um, work to create what they called the Indian digital stack, which was like the plumbing to create a digital economy. And that has created a foundation which in some ways is generation skipping the development curves we've seen in other places around the world. Um, we made the decision to go deeper into India. We already had wholesale clubs there. But we made a decision to go deeper by making the investment we made into two businesses in one group, which was the Flipkart group, which is Flipkart, which is primarily an e-commerce marketplace online, and then PhonePay, which is a payments business. Um, Flipkart is very much a homegrown Indian business. It has an incredible user base, and it's attracting first-time users, not just in metropolitan cities, but out in tier two, tier three, tier four cities, who are new users into digital India for the first time. And that's an incredibly a focused business on we're building for India, we're building for solutions for the Indian customer. The phone pay business um, is a, started out as a payments business and it runs on some payment rails called UPI in India, which the government introduced. It's unique in the world. That scaling of that business, I think, is a real lesson for the world, which is once the um, groundwork is in place, it is incredible how something can grow. So if I tell you that from a payments perspective, um, when we made the original investment in that business, um, their total payments value, so that flow of payments through the app that people were using was about $70 billion, which I was like, that's already a really big number. Yeah. Um, today, it's just gone through a trillion dollars. Wow. That scale is incredible, and it's facilitating so much in the country. They have $400 million users, um, but they also connect 36 million merchants. So this is both sides of the equation. How do you connect the Karanas, the small stores in India, into the digital economy as well, and actually therefore really help all of the parts of the country to be able to grow with this platform of digitization behind it. So for me, that is a really interesting case study about when the circumstances become right, the way things can scale at the pace with which that can happen should not be underestimated because if it's easier for people to use it no. and they trust it, people use it. Um, 
but this, this, uh, these examples you're giving us of China and India, of course, it would have been harder to do uh, if you were operating in even more countries. I think uh, four or five years ago, uh, I mean, it didn't happen instantly, but you know, Walmart exited uh, Great Britain, it exited Japan, it, and, and it basically went from, uh, oper uh, from being in 11 countries, not excluding, uh, not including the, the, um, uh, the satellite countries, uh, to six. So what are your, what are the criteria for, I mean, it's a big world out there, so it what is. are the criteria for you? It is, um, this was like, it's a journey over five years and um, at the start of, of that, we looked around the world and made the decision that we couldn't grow, improve our returns and be a strong local business powered by Walmart, which is our strategy, if we tried to do a little bit everywhere. So we sat down and we said, if all of the portfolio that we have, where do we think, A, we have strong local businesses that pretty much ticked for everywhere. Where do we think that they can benefit from being part of Walmart? Or could others do a more effective job of running them than we could? That brought us to a smaller list. And then how do we feel about the long-term growth and returns of those businesses as well? That did result in us divesting of four businesses, which actually, you talked about what our sales are today, was almost 40 billion of sales wow. that we divested, which is a pretty bold thing yeah. to do. And we sold the company that I grew up in and learned retailing, yeah. which is Asda, which was our biggest country. But we knew that if we didn't do that, so we couldn't focus where it really mattered and concentrated in where we could see the growth. And then the seven businesses, six countries, that we operate in yeah. today, we see a role in the portfolio for every one of them and we have the resources and capabilities and talent, actually. Talent is a really important part of this as well in order to be able to operate them and help each of them grow and share from each other. So they're strong businesses in their own right, run locally, tailored to the local customer, but they have the added advantage of the leverage that being part of Walmart can bring. And that combination is important. But the way that we now look at this is to say, even though each country is different, customers are more similar, but they're at different stages of life and development. There are three priorities that ring true everywhere, which is scale omnichannel, sorry, it's leading an omnichannel, it's scaling in our marketplaces, and it's developing new businesses and services to help customers and then connecting them to be even more effective. So whilst it's easy to think of us as being complex, the way I try to think about it and the teams try to think about it is, Think about what's the same and the simplicity, and that helps you drive execution, connectivity, and leverage, which I think is the secret source of, of how you do this around the world. I'm glad you, you mentioned focus. Uh, you know, we, we've seen uh, my ancestral homeland, Canada, seems to be a Bermuda Triangle for some retailers. And, um, it's similar to the U.S., you know, and yet a lot of companies uh, trip there. And, and obviously, you know, com uh, companies, retailers that are eager for growth uh, look abroad. It seems to me it's, it's, it's uh, fashion brands and luxury that seem to do the best by being in a lot of countries. But, uh, you know, what are, what are the classic mistakes you see? We don't need to name names. I can do that, <laughs> but you don't need to. Um, what are some of the classic mistakes you have seen in retailers that go abroad and then uh, trip up? Yeah, I don't even have to look at other retailers. Like, we've had our fair share yeah. of this in history, and we learned a lot from it. We were in Germany for a period of time. I tried to operate in Europe. It's one of the first things that they did. And we learned um, over time that you have to understand local culture, local nuances. You have to be thoughtful about the supply chain networks that you create in order to be able to do that. And most importantly, you have to have brilliant teams. And um, for us, this strong local business part, it is, it is just a phrase and a piece of paper unless we have brilliant teams in each market that are making the decisions and setting the strat strategies day to day. And I'm not sure what everybody else has done, but for us, focusing on that has helped make us successful. But 
like we've learned which is you know one of the reasons we came out of some of the markets that we we came in we went into as well so it's a journey and the the one thing i think that is important is you're either in or you're not yeah so half-hearted is not a good place to be like that is the other thing that I would say. Right, so don't treat another market as an afterthought or, oh, we can get another 2 or 3% from there because it exactly. doesn't... Yeah, consumers always tell you what they want. They do. So in these final seconds, really quickly, what would you say is the biggest difference? Uh, Judith was uh, Chief Operating Officer of Walmart US before she went to Walmart International. <laughs> what, what, what is more complex? Oh, that is like a trick question right at the yeah. end. Um, Neither is complex. One is scale, one is complexity. Both have both. They cross over. Love them both. Wonderful. Well, on that note, join me in thanking Judith for joining us today. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>